and they seemingly were all giants. The home of Tommy Lawton. Tommy Lawton, England's centre forward and now captain of Notts County, was in great demand before the FA Cup first round match against the amateurs from Horsham. There was a vast crowd and it's reported that it contained everyone who could possibly get away from the Horsham area to shout for their team. Lawton shakes with Hughes, the Horsham centre half, and now here are some episodes from the match with the spotlight on Tommy, white shirt number nine. True, the visitors had scored in the first two minutes, but Notts County made up for it by replying with nine goals, three of which were scored by Lawton himself, as indeed you might well have expected. The frame is similar, the hair is still as black as jet, but for the old pro, life now proceeds at a more leisurely pace. He just passes the time away watching television or pottering his way to the shops with his wife, Gay. Time was, of course, when he couldn't walk down a street in England without drawing a crowd. Now he's simply a face in a crowd. Just another elderly gentleman waiting for the bus to Nottingham. But even if the great days have departed, he still remembers them clearly and how they all began, right back to that New Year's Eve of 1936, when Everton paid Burnley seven and a half thousand pounds for a big, raw 17-year-old who perhaps one day would take the place of the legendary Dixie Dean. On the New Year's Day, as I signed on the New Year's Eve, on the New Year's Day, Everton reserves were playing Burnley reserves at Goodison Park. So I left Burnley on the 7 o'clock train in the morning uh, and went to uh, Liverpool Lime Street to report to Goodison Park. We got in, as you can imagine, on New Year's morning. You know, the trains were even late then. But uh, when I got there, I walked down, down to Dale Street to catch a tram to go up to, uh, to Goodison Park. And uh, I got, so I asked the chap, I said, how do you get to, to Everton Football Ground? Get off a spell of lane, whacker, he said, you know, and be all right. So the tram came, four air tram. And uh, I said, could you put me off at Everton Football Ground, please? I said to the conductor. So he said, uh, of course, of course, he said. And he said, you're young Lawton, aren't you? So I, I said, yeah, you'll never be as good as Dixie, he said. So I thought, well, at 17 and three months, you know, I thought, oh, that's a lovely reception to, to come and do it to ever told you to see. Dixie was always my idol. Whenever I went and played on the bottom, as we used to call it, you know, on the dirt patch at the, you know, the bottom where I, where I lived in Bolton, I was always Dixie. In the currency of 1936, seven and a half thousand pounds was a huge investment in a 17-year-old, but how well he repaid them. In each of his first two full seasons, he finished top of the first division scoring list. Dixie Dean had been replaced. And if Everton had good reason to be grateful, then so did England, as the Scots were destined to discover. The equaliser, which came from England's brilliant centre-forward Lawton, was one of the most sparkling individual efforts seen at Wembley. Four minutes later, Lawton put England one up. Lawton scored again, his third goal, making it 4-2. It was an England team brimming with entertainers, and the finest of them was the bow-legged magician who made the England number seven shirt his own. Of course, Stanley Matthews. The Stan to me was the greatest thing on two legs that I ever played with. Uh, I always remember my first game with, with Stan. Uh, as I said, I was at the tender age of 18, and Stan was an established, and I mean, for me to to go and meet players like Stan Matthews and Len Golden, you know. It was out of this world. It was, I, I felt like got Mr. Matthews and that, you know. And we we played uh, the Irish League at, in Belfast at Windsor Park. And that was my first uh, 
meeting with him and playing with him. And I always remember him in the dressing room and he, he always used to come. It was always like, when Stan was going, it was, it was always like this. Did he smoke? No. No, what was he, it? He always, always used to blow through his forefinger and his thumb. Really? <laughs> no, young lad, no, young lad. Now, whatever you do, he says, I know that you play with Tori Gillick, he says, at Devon. He says, and I know, he says, that Tori likes the ball on the inside of the back, he says, for him to go running on to, he says. But he says, now, whatever you do, he says, now, don't put the ball on the inside of the back for me to go running on to, he says, like you do with Tori Gillick, he says, because I won't want to know. <laughs> so I said, oh, well, all right, uh, I nearly called him Mr. Mark. All right, Stan, you know. He said, on my feet. <laughs> Down on my feet, he says. Not up there, he says. I'll do the rest. <laughs> so I said, oh, thank you. Thank you. So we kicked off. Sure enough, first couple of minutes, what happens? I get the ball in the inside right position. Beautiful ball. Stands at the halfway line, on the touch line. I told you, he said. Not for me. Here. I said, I'm, I'm off this way. It's all right, he says. Don't do it again. And I never did. I never did. Every time, there you are, maestro. Matthews, Lawton and the rest lost six years of club football to the war. When it ended in 1945, Lawton moved to Chelsea for £12,500. Now, what was the position as far as the clubs were concerned in those days? I mean, you were an experienced man, but did, did you all live in club houses or did you invest in your own property? Or what was the scheme of things in those days? Well, no, the club after the war, they, they found you a house. So, so the, the minimum or maximum wage was combated in a way by the fact that they put you in a, a free house? Oh, no, no. You had, to, you had to pay rent for it. I see. So you, you, paid, you paid the rent. Mm. Which was what? Uh, well, in those days, it would be about £3.10 a week. Mm. And, the, and your wages were still, what, by now £14, was it? It was it gone up to £12 then. £12. So, and still £2 for a win and £1 for a draw. So you arrive at Chelsea? Yes. Uh, what was that, 1946? 1945. 1945. Well, I was still in the army. And were they a good times? Was Chelsea a good club? Uh, they were at the beginning. Uh, and then things didn't turn out, uh, you know, quite as uh, I'd hoped that they would do. Because of? There was, uh, it could have been 50-50 on either side. It might have been 60-40 on mine. Uh, one doesn't quite know. Flash of uh, personalities? Flash or? of personalities. Uh, with the directors. Uh, you see, I didn't like people in those days. I mean, I was England's centre forward and I was a good one, uh, in my own mind. You know, and after having been in the army under discipline for, you know, six and a half, seven years, uh, I thought, well, there's a little bit of freedom. Uh, and when people came in who didn't know anything about it, didn't know football, or, you know, from a tennis ball, started telling you what you should do and what you shouldn't do, I thought, well, now's the time for me to uh, let you know that, you know, that you don't know anything about it, which I did. The moves followed one after another, to Notts County for football's first £20,000 fee, to Brentford for £15,000, and to Arsenal, who paid £6,000 and gave him the happiest years of his career. But Lawton's personal fortune never kept pace with his great fame. As your career came to an end, did you start thinking then that you should invest in bricks and mortar, secure for the future? Well, well, I was always br I was brought up in the in the old-fashioned Lancashire way, you know, by my grandfather. The bricks and mortar are no use to you, lad. Really? You know, they're nothing but trouble. Bricks and mortar. If they can rent a place, rent it. And, Would you uh, still say that today? Uh, With the way prices have gone. Well, if you're fortunate enough to to to, uh, to be able to rent one, I would say yes. You'd still rent? Well, I still do. Yeah, yeah. What about the commercial side in your day, Tom? Were people knocking on doors saying, come and advertise this and come and show us that? 
Well, no, no. You see, today is big business in football, really big business. In my day, there wasn't, uh, you know, such thing as agents and, you know, solicitors are looking after your affairs or accountants doing your figures and what have you. But uh, I did advertise when I was a, a boy. Uh, of, uh, I always remember I got a Dundee cake presented to me <laughs> when I scored a hat trick. I tell you what, a few of the lads get a bit more than a Dundee cake now. You've suffered ill health, Tom, over the last few years. And because of the system and the time you played, you didn't amass a great fortune. How do you cope with inflation and everyday living now? Well, I, I am on supplementary benefit. And uh, we live that way accordingly. And uh, we've learned to live with it. As I say, it is uh, like everyone else, I, I suppose, that's uh, in our position. Mm. We, uh, the savings all we... went? The savings, what they were, gone? Oh, yes. Once. Oh, yes. A visit to a football ground is a rare experience for Tommy Lawton these days. He's no great love for the modern game and its obsession with strength, fitness and work rate. Nor does he think too highly of the men who play that game. But surely some of the moderns must have flourished in the age of entertainers. Well, to me, there's only one, is uh, Trevor Francis. He's got intelligence, he's fast, he's quick, he's probably a couple of... Uh, jumps ahead of the players that he's playing with, anticipating. Uh, I'll tell you this, uh, I wish I could have played with him because he would have been a better player playing with me. And I like to think that I would have been a better centre forward if he'd have been playing with me. A pipe dream, of course. They were never destined to play together, but they met at Old Trafford for the Manchester derby. In a crowd of 57,000, the injured Francis sat in the stand and chatted across the generations to the old man with the jet black hair. An anonymous man, but one who used to be one of the great Saturday afternoon heroes. You can only win much of the scoring goals, can't yeah. you? And there's no good going out there and saying, all right, well, we've got a point, we'll keep it. You win nothing on that, will you? With a three-point system, makes a big difference now. I know, yes. I still feel though, that uh, even though you have these three points, uh, if you get a point away from home, it's still a good result. A good point. But, yeah, it uh, is. It's important not to drop any points out of it. Oh, it is. That ball went from there. Yeah. One bite there, and they were still in the same position, weren't they? Yeah. I was talking with Kevin Keegan the other day and we were both talking about the fact that we're, we're fortunate that we're playing at a time when we're both earning big salaries and uh, we're playing, you know, when there's a lot of money in football and it can't go on forever. And uh, I think that as long as you realise how fortunate you are, mm. uh, you can't go wrong. My wife and I were happy, my children, and uh, what more can we want? A happy life, a contented life. Money doesn't mean that uh, you're going to be happy. Zone 